In this video, I'm going to give you a brief overview of some of the more prominent flaws and contradictions that can be found within special relativity. But I do expect my audience to be familiar with both the light clock thought experiment and the twin paradox. Number one, simultaneity and local time. According to Einstein, it is necessary to rely on the frame-dependent speed of light in order to determine that two events that are separated by a vast distance are simultaneous. Also according to Einstein, in order to establish the distance between the two events, we need to establish that the two events were simultaneous. Einstein concludes that because simultaneity varies depending on the frame of reference, then distances also vary depending on the frame of reference. However, in reality, there is no need to rely solely on clocks synchronized with light pulses as a way to either determine the simultaneity of events or to measure distances. And if the supervelocity and selection theory is correct, then to use clocks synchronized with light pulses would be a terrible way to measure either simultaneity or distances. Fortunately, we have the option of using motion parallax, visual angles, focus and blurriness, or standardized sizes as a means of measuring distances. Number two, excessively local, narrow, and fragile definitions. Instead of pursuing precision and perfection, concordance and corroboration should be the goal of our definition and measurement of fundamental physical quantities. I would recommend that we focus on making the metaphorical tower of physics that we've been erecting more stable rather than just trying to make it as tall as possible. It is both premature and hazardous to accept an extremely local and narrow definition of time. Unfortunately, due to the influence of Einstein, time is currently defined locally and distance is defined by the speed of light. The international definition for the second is currently based on the atomic clock, and that of the meter is based on the speed of light. Einstein has unwittingly set up a false dichotomy between local and global time. My claim is that time is fundamentally an integration of global and local phenomena because it depends on the interactions between objects and their environment. Einstein's skepticism about the existence of global time does not warrant the current dogmatism about the absolute integrity of local time. In order to be trustworthy and reliable, scientific concepts need to be robust. Definitions need to be comprehensive and methods of measurement need to be diverse. What we have arrived at now are extremely narrow and fragile concepts of space and time. Relying on the speed of light to define space was a mistake, and so was relying on the oscillation of a single atom to define time. Neither the speed of light nor the atomic clock can provide a stable foundation for the definition and measurement of time, space, and velocity. All that an atomic clock does is it reports on the oscillation of a single isolated atom. Just as the rate of oscillation of a guitar string or a metronome can be manipulated, so can the rate of oscillation of an atom in an atomic clock. These local changes in the rate of vibration do not imply any change in the rate of the passage of time itself, and they should not be interpreted as if they were a change in the rate of the passage of time itself. But yet they are routinely interpreted in this way because time has been defined locally and narrowly. Number three, Lorentz equations are derived from an alternating speed of light. If you need a refresher on the light clock thought experiment, then I won't give you one here because there are dozens of them available on YouTube and elsewhere. Instead, I will just jump right into the heart of the matter. Most people who work with Lorentz equations have never attempted to derive them from first principles. The Lorentz equations can be, and in fact are derived from an interpretation of the light clock thought experiment. It is only through deriving them yourself that you can fully appreciate the assumptions that go into them 
as well as the inherent limitations on their applicability. One fact that I want to make clear is that in order to derive these equations, it is necessary to assume that the light travels at different relative speeds as it moves back and forth between the mirrors of the light clock. This assumption is hidden by the fact that, by convention, only the average velocity and the average time of the light ends up counting towards the final calculated value. But even though these differences are averaged out, they must still be present in order to derive the Lorentz equations for time dilation and length contraction in the first place. Hence, simply by applying these equations, one must assume and also confirm the idea that light may move at different speeds depending on which direction it's moving in. A related point is that the orientation of the light clock also has a significant impact on the calculations. The timing of the bounces of the light change depending on what angle the mirrors are oriented at in relation to the direction of relative motion. When the mirrors are facing parallel to the direction of motion, an overall slowing effect becomes most pronounced, and the speed difference also becomes most pronounced. When the speed of light is averaged across the two directions, this masks the fact that time dilation actually toggles back and forth between positive and negative values, along with the fact that the relative speed of the light toggles between different values. The light moves slower relative to the light clock as it moves from the back mirror to the front mirror, and faster as it moves from the front mirror to the back mirror. Furthermore, if you dare to think outside of the light clock thought experiment, then you will find that neither time dilation nor length contraction can resolve the discrepancies between different observers. The reason for this is that the light clock thought experiment only contemplates the average two-way speed of light. Time dilation and length contraction do not work to resolve the discrepancies between observers if we are considering the one-way speed of light in isolation. Number four, interpreting the twin paradox. Again, if you need a refresher on the twin paradox, I won't give you one here because these are very easy to find on the internet. Unlike with gravitational time dilation, time dilation that is caused by inertial motion is inherently subjective. I use the analogy of visual angle shrinking and the analogy of a poker game in order to get across the difference between how special relativity and the supervelocity and selection theory of light interpret the symmetry in the twin paradox. According to special relativity, time dilation due to inertial motion accumulates over time and would result in a net age difference between two identical twins and in a difference between the readings of their clocks if they happen to be carrying clocks. This becomes a paradox because both twins must observe the other twin to have aged less than themselves. I would compare this to a poker game because both players will agree on the total amount of money that is at stake, which accumulates over time, but they would disagree on who will win the money. This equal but opposite perception on the part of each twin is known as a symmetry. If one twin is to be right, then the other twin must be wrong. According to the supervelocity and selection theory of light, however, both twins must be wrong. While their perceptions are indeed symmetrical, because they are equal but opposite, neither of the two twins are correct. The illusion is similar to how two people who walk away from one another might perceive the other as shrinking because they look smaller, but neither person is actually shrinking. Number 5. The Denial of Motion in Cosmology A Distinction Without a Difference there is an enormous distinction without a difference in cosmology. While it is acknowledged that the distances between galaxies are increasing in size over time, it is not permissible to refer to this change in distance over time as motion, and there are two reasons for this. The first reason is that if the galaxies were moving apart from one another, as opposed to merely experiencing adjustments in their distances over time, then we would need to observe time dilation according to special relativity, and we clearly do not observe this. The second reason 
is that if this motion were recognized as motion, then it would also have to be faster than light motion with respect to galaxies that are billions of light years apart. Because the observation of superluminal motion would refute special relativity, this motion cannot be recognized as motion or called by that name. The standard way of interpreting the redshift data from distant galaxies is to say that space itself is expanding and that the light waves are being stretched out by the expansion of space as opposed to being stretched out by the Doppler effect. However, the mathematical models and calculations would be exactly the same if we assume that there is relative motion and we just apply the Doppler effect without time dilation. There is no conceivable way to distinguish between these competing models. This truly is a distinction without a difference. The only tangible difference is found in the use of superficial words and in distorting the definition of the word motion in order to exclude it from the discourse. According to the supervelocity and selection theory of light, what we see in the redshift values is really the Doppler effect, and the distant galaxies appear to be moving apart from one another because they really are moving apart from one another. There is no need to change the definitions of motion or velocity. It just so happens that these redshift observations refute special relativity in two different ways. I am perfectly happy to allow special relativity to be refuted by the observed redshift values, but this puts me at odds with the physics and cosmology community at large, who don't want special relativity to be a falsifiable theory. However, salvaging the theory from refutation does come at the cost of its scientific credibility. <laughs>